and where now begins. I, I have been sending it to every one of my friends during this time of COVID. Um, I, I was so inspired by it. And I can't think of a better time to read this book. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Elizabeth, bring her on, and uh, let her talk about her books. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. It's fantastic that you're in Chicago and I'm here, and I know some of the people listening here are all over the place. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, this is a great thing. We're delighted to have you. Um, Elizabeth, please talk, talk about your books, what inspired you to write them. Um, you know, your books are both personal and, um, but, also, um, but also inspiring for, for everyone. So what, what inspired you and how did you get started? Can you tell a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> I, I've been working as a journalist uh, for, well, almost two decades uh, with radio and television, but I always had this longing to write, and, but never thought I'd be good enough to do it. And then maybe 13 years ago now, I, something happened that made me decide that now is the time and I have to give it a try. So, um, to make a long story short, the Vienna book, which I think you have over in Chicago, I don't have it here, but the Vienna book, that the actually, book? yes, and in Vienna Woods, The Trees Remain. This is a non-fiction book, but it's written in a very literary style, and it, it came to me quite literally because someone had read my first book, and she liked it she felt connected to it so she came to me and said that I have over 500 letters that my father received as a child when he was a refugee in Sweden and they're all here in this IKEA box but I don't read I haven't read them because they're in German but would you like them she said uh, and write something about it and I said I don't want them because I don't speak German and the story she told me that her father had been sent to Sweden from Vienna to, to avoid the Nazi persecution, that meant, you know, I understood it would be a story about the Holocaust. And I really did not want to write about that. It was something that was painful in my history, in my family, and I, I didn't want to touch that pain. But of course, after a couple of months, when I'd been thinking about it, I couldn't resist. And I started looking at these letters, having them translated, doing research about the people who wrote them. And that became in Vienna, the trees are still stand. No, they still remain. Sorry, it's a complicated title, even for me. So I realized also in this process that I had a core of a subject, a theme, which was my core. I could, of course, write about a lot of things. As a journalist, you know a lot about a lot of things. But I also realized as a writer, I could only write about the most, the most important things, the things that matters the absolute most to me. And there, I believe, and I hope, that what matters the most to me also connects to other people. Um, and so far, so far, I, it seems like my book connect, my books connect uh, all over the world, and I'm, I'm, it's fantastic. But that was the Vienna book, and then in that book there is this character. I mean, it's a non-fiction book, so he existed, and he was the Swedish fascist leader. Uh, his name was Per Engdahl, and he was actually not very big in Sweden, but he became very important in a European perspective, uh, making the ideas of fascism and Nazis, the Nazi ideology survive the peace. Uh -huh. So I decided I would write a, a biography of him. And when I did that, I was looking for a specific 
piece of information that appeared in 1947. I knew something had happened in his life in 1947, but I couldn't get it confirmed. So I ended up reading the newspapers, the major newspapers in Sweden for this year from day one to day 365. And that's how the year of 1947 hit me uh, when I read every single day and the news reports from these days. Uh, and I have this, this is the American edition of it. Uh, and I just realized that 1947 was a year that was deeply connected to our time. When I was reading the papers, there were subjects there that were completely here and now. We had feminism, we had jihadism, we had the Israel-Palestine uh, growing as a problem and a conflict and the solutions being sought for. Uh, and there are um, the division, there is the division of Europe. Uh, then it was called the Cold War. Now we call it something else, but the division is actually still there. It's, so there were so many things, also beautiful things in literature, in art, in music. So I just felt I wanted to capture this. I thought, of course, someone had done it already. I went out and looked for books about 1947, but I realized no one had written them. So I decided to write it. I have the sense that after the war, people wanted to put it behind them. Yeah. And so perhaps that's why, you know, nobody looked at that post-war era from that perspective. but. Certainly, it, it makes, uh, you know, it makes perfect sense today as you read this book and you think about the music that's being written now, the um, what's going on in, you know, like in the culture um, of the world now during a pandemic with with um, issues of racism and and and, you know, everything that's going on. Um, and so I, I like the book just it 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 gels it it gels with today and and it's a it's a it's it's a book everybody should read <laughs> I, I do have a question for you yeah i know that you know in reading you know in, in the book you talk about um you talk about your childhood and your parents and you've said that it's the holocaust is a painful subject for you as it is for many of us mm -hmm. How does writing about it, how does that, how does it work for you? Does it heal or does it hurt more? Uh, neither. Uh, it's, it does definitely not heal. Uh, that's, that writing should be therapeutic in any way, I think is, it doesn't work with a trauma like uh, the Holocaust. And it doesn't make anything worse either. It can't sort of get any worse, I think. Uh, but it becomes, um, for me, it becomes a kind of well where I can go and, and, and fetch things. That's one thing. It's also, um, it's also a way of taking it outside oneself to, to be able to look at it. That doesn't mean that anything goes away from the inside, but it does give you more perspectives. Uh, so writing about something like the Holocaust um, and also putting it outside oneself as, as one does when you write and someone else, is, else reads it, um, it becomes something you can talk about and then it also becomes um, something I can share. So all these things, they generate good things, but it doesn't mean that what's painful in the beginning goes away or heals, but it, it becomes meaningful, that the, a meaning adds, a sense of meaning is added to it when you start talking, communicating or sharing. So, um, hmm. But I've, I've spoken to other writers uh, about this and th when they all agree that nothing is healed by writing. 
but it's there. So we might as well make use of it. It's such a big part of us. Right. Uh, and being a writer is always about using what's inside, combining it with what's outside of you. So it's that movement that creates the writing process. What do you hope, what do you hope to inspire the reader to think or to act on? Like what is, when, when you write, what, what, what do you hope that the, your reader will take away from it? Well, I don't write with an agenda, agenda in that way. I don't have a purpose. Uh, I, I write because there's something uh, within me that wants to be expressed or to be shared or communicated. But with 1947, I mean, I'm very, very happy if someone understands that history is not past time. It's still here. It affects us, the good things and the bad things. And I mean, 1947 is such an interesting year because the, so many people, especially in the Western part of the world, what we call the Western part now at least, they were, um, they wanted to make sure that nothing like the Holocaust could ever happen again. So, I mean, they worked in so many levels, politically and, and in humanitarian and in legal, uh, the, the levels of, of society to make sure that nothing like this would happen again. And what did they do? They created the Declaration of Human Rights, the UN asked Eleanor Roosevelt to, to create this document that stated that every individual in the whole world had a certain amount of rights just because he or she was born. It wasn't connected to a nationality or an identity. It was only connected to one, every each, a single human being. So this is one thing. And then we have um, all the legal uh, changes. For instance, I write about Raphael Lemkin, the man who in created the, the concept of genocide. This was not a crime. The crime didn't exist during the Holocaust, but he reacted to what had happened and he needed, he thought the world needs this crime, which unfortunately, he was right in, uh, in thinking. So he creates this crime and now even if things like this happen, genocide still happen. We have it in Myanmar, we've had it in Yugoslavia when that existed, uh, in Rwanda. But now we're at least agree on that this is actually a crime. During World War II, this was not a common uh, we weren't agreeing on it. So I just want to make my, I want to connect history with the present because these things are connected. And on an individual personal level, I think we all know that things that happened in our family, for instance, maybe they happened our grandparents or our parents, but they carry on, they affect us, even if we didn't experience for instance, the Holocaust ourselves, we are very much affected by traumas like that. But it doesn't have to be a trauma of that, you know, great size. It can be abuse, it can be a suicide, things like that go through families, through generations, and several generations after the thing, the trauma happened, are still affected. So this is also a connection of time understanding that the past is still here it moves around us it can also be a very good thing um, but we can't just close the door and say that was then right and, uh, i think that's if i have something i want to tell anyone that's that mm. thank you um i you you write um and in the woods the trees remain. You talk about Otto's relationship with his friend, 
the founder of IKEA. And um, for me, that was, I had no idea that, that he was linked to the Nazi party or that he had ties to the Nazi party until really I read your book. And I, and I think, I think I might not be the only one. And, um, and you talk about good and evil. And um, can you talk a little bit about the time that you interviewed him and how, how that went? Yes, of course. Well, just to explain for the, the people who are listening who haven't read the book, this, this book is about a 13-year-old bo boy sent to Sweden from Vienna. And uh, his parents, uh, they, he was their only child, and they, of course, want to re reunite with him, but they, they can't get out of, of Nazi Germany. So they write letters to him, and they never get out. They, they finally are murdered. He, he stays in Sweden. He becomes a farmer's help. And when he's 19, he applies for a job at the... Kamprod estate where the Kamprod family lives and Ingvar who becomes the founder of IKEA he is then 18 and the two guys become real good friends uh, and then when uh, Ingvar starts to do his um, starts working with IKEA Otto this Jewish refugee uh, now an orphan he becomes his closest man and, and they work together creating IKEA. So that's the background to this story. And when I started writing this book, I knew that Ingvar Kamprod, the IKEA founder, had been connected to the Swedish fascist movement. That had already been out uh, publicly uh, from different investigative journalism stories that had been published. Uh, what I could find out, I found papers from the Swedish secret police that he was actually a member of the hardcore Nazi party as well. And that the Swedish secret police had surveillance on him when he was uh, 17, 18 years old because they, they wanted to follow his movements and they read his letters and there he promises to recruit more members to the Nazi movement, etc. So at one period of his life, he's, he was quite dedicated. So this guy is very interesting, the IKEA founder, because he was closely connected to the fascist movement, which was very anti-Semitic. He was, for a time, definitely member of the Nazi, hardcore Nazi party, and he really loved his friend, the Jewish refugee, Otto Ullmann. Uh, so... Um, He's an enigma, one could say, but we can also state that he's also very human because this is something that I find it some, quite beautiful that someone with these ideas, the thing with Ingvar Kamprad is that he actually grew up in a Nazi home. Uh, his grandmother was a very strong person. She had emigrated from uh, Sudetenland, the, the part of, of uh, Europe that Hitler then reoccupied to become Great Germany. Uh, and she loved Hitler for, for this, and uh, Ingvar Kamprad's father called himself a Nazi. His mother did not, though, so it was a, 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 an interesting family structure, but he grew up saying Uncle Hitler. That's how personal it was in this family. So that he actually connected with the fascist movement and then the Nazi movement is not totally surprising. What is maybe more surprising then is that he actually loves his friend, Otto Ullmann, and they have a deep and uh, inspiring relationship where they drink, they work, and they chase women together for at least a decade. So I met him because when I, I, I uh, sent a mail to his assistant on IKEA uh, in Switzerland and said that I'm going to write a book about Otto Ullmann and would Ingvar consider an interview? Uh, 
so I, there was a reply within maybe three minutes. That's how much Otto Ullmann meant to him. And he said, of course, of course. Uh, but then it took some time before we could actually meet, but we met at the headquarters in Sweden, IKEA headquarters. And of course he was an old man, but he was definitely still the boss and the assistant was there all the time. And, and I had my tape recorder and I also had Otto's daughter with me because they were sort of old connections, the two. Uh, so it was an interesting in conversation where Ingvar Kamprad did not want to reflect uh, on anything he found controversial. He did not like me asking questions about the fascist movement. He denied saying Uncle Hitler but I, then I finally said, but it's in, it's in one of your, one of the books about you. It, sta it, sta it says here that you actually grew up saying Uncle Hitler. So, and then we had to get the book out and the assistant read Uncle Hitler. So only then could Ingvar Kamprad agree on that he actually had said Uncle Hitler. So it was a situation where I had to prove everything that he didn't like in order to make him talk about it. Uh, he wanted to talk about his, his, the good things, the fun things. And I think that's also part of who he was. He wasn't a person who sat down and reflected uh, on his life, went through what he'd done and, and why he had done it. He was, he's a doer, he was a doer. I mean, he did IKEA, he made it become worldwide successful. So it was an interesting meeting and it was only after the meeting that I found the information about his membership in the Nazi party. And when I wanted to talk about that with him, he, he wouldn't have anything more to do with me. So that's the, that's the short story. <laughs> did he ever, um, did he ever make peace with Otto? Is is Otto gone now? Is Otto deceased? Yes, Otto, Otto was deceased when I started writing the books. His daughter, Eva, who came to right. me with the letters, she had received the letters on his deathbed, actually. Uh, so yes, I never met Otto himself, but I did, I mean, I've had close conversations with his widow and his three children. And no, they did not make peace. And when it became publicly known that Ingvar Kamprad had been connected to the fascist movement, which was very anti-Semitic, Otto became very hurt and very angry. Apparently he had, had none, no idea about that when they were friends. Ingvar Kamprad must have kept this like separate chambers. They, he did not share this with Otto. So I think Otto, were, no, he was very, very angry with Ingvar, but they, they sort of lost connection. I, I would imagine that for Otto to move on, mm -hmm. he, he had to sever that connection. Like, um, Yes, well, it was a, a world created by Ingvar Kamprad and Otto wanted to create his own world. So, so yes, they had to go different ways. But still, the Kamprad estate was kind of a rich state and they had farmers working for them. Uh, and Otto married one of these farmers' daughters. Right. So he still kept a connection to the estate, to the Kamprod family. So this is complicated psychological movements in life. Were the children of Otto, were they raised as Jews? No, uh, I think they were raised without any particular religion, but I've mostly talked about Eva, the daughter, about this. And she and I very much shared this sense of ambivalence towards being Jewish because the Holocaust was sort of the only Jewish, um, the only thing we had inherited of the Jewish identity. 
her parents, I mean, Otto was completely assimilated when he was a child. The family, uh, they, they celebrated Christmas, they ate pork. They were typically, and that, that's the same as for my Hungarian Jewish family. This is the European totally assimilated Jewish uh, population who believed that they were the same as their neighbors. And it's only when the Nazi ideology takes over society that they are separated and, and uh, become something else than they thought they were. So Otto, he hadn't, he'd been assimilated his own life. He wasn't, he didn't believe particularly in God, especially not after what had happened to his parents. And uh, so no, the children were not raised in any religion, but in a kind of, but Sweden is also a very secular country. So this is, this wasn't strange in any way. It was, it was a, two two parameters going together Otto's background and the Swedish secular society joining forces so to speak mm. thank you I, I you know the one I did want to ask you you had the letters from Otto's parents yeah Otto. yeah you have you didn't have the reverse obviously no because they were deported and murdered I mean all their belongings were uh, who knows what happened to them? Hmm. So you had to somewhat imagine his response to those letters. Yes, but that wasn't, yes, I did, but it wasn't that complicated because they write to him. They're they're very they were they were very strong in in their way of being parents. I mean, they wanted to comfort him. They wanted to cheer him up. They wanted to keep him strong. They wanted him to be a decent human being. So their letters are full of references to you wrote, you were longing to come home. But we can tell you that that is not a bad thing because longing to come home to us, that only means that your heart is alive and that you are a real human being with a, with a, with a, a real heart in your body. So they made references to what he had written in his letters. So I could use that to paint a picture of him. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you now. I'm sorry. Sorry. And to infer how he might have responded. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and I had, I mean, in the book, there are, I think, 51 or 52 letters published, but I had over 500 uh, letters to work with. So I did have quite a lot of material. Uh, it was so interesting to read the progression of the letters, how it started out parents who thought that they were going to see their child again. They thought that he, they had sent him away for safety and were just waiting for their opportunity to leave. Yeah. Um, and then to kind of watch how the tone of the letters changed and um, how they became more uh, coded you know, in their messages and um, it was uh, very, very interesting. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you to have read those translations for the first time. Well, to be honest, at first I was very disappointed because I thought, you know, here I have 500 letters from, the, from Vienna when it was occupied by the Nazis and I would now get a window into this everyday reality. And then I read the letters and they were about what football and the weather and, and very trivial things. And I was disappointed, but then I understood why they were seemingly trivial. Uh, I mean, it wasn't all about censorship. Of course, censorship is one reason for it. But the other is that these letters became the only normal thing they had left. Being a parent, talking about how is your trousers, you must have, they must have become too small for you now. And, you know, things like everyday parenthood, that was 
that in a no, in their world, which was becoming more and more uh, unnormal, they were not allowed to work. They were not allowed to have a radio. They weren't allowed to go out after certain hours. They weren't allowed more than certain small amounts of food. The, and then they were taken out of their home and forced into another flat with someone they didn't know. I mean, their world was going, turning into a nightmare and the nightmare was turning into an even worse nightmare, of course. These are trivial words for what actually happened. So the letters remain their link to the, the life they once had known with their child to the being a normal parent, being a loving, caring parent, being a responsible parent, having, having a, uh, some kind of influence of your everyday life because they had lost all that. So when I understood that this is what the letters are about as well, then they became um, very, very painful and very revealing. So, there were several layers in the reading of them. I, I, can, I can only imagine. Um, I, it, our own family, um, my husband's parents were survivors. And um, when I read the letters from family in Germany, once they were able to get out, um, it's, uh, it's incomprehensible. It's, it's just, it's, it's incomprehensible. I agree. So, mm -hmm. so I do have a question for you. Um, you know, recently we we also show film. Uh, we're the Chicago Jewish Film Festival, and um, we were talking to a filmmaker from Hungary, and he had done the film 1945, mm -hmm. and talking about how his film is received in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And um, you've won awards in Sweden for your books. And I just wondered, because you do, you do pull back a curtain. You mm -hmm. are pulling back a curtain in your books. You know, not everything is rosy in Sweden, the way that maybe we've been led to believe. And I wondered, um, do you feel like, do you, do you feel like the books have been well received? Did you get... Did you get negative feedback, you know, from any aspects of society? No, no, uh, no. That the the book we've talked most about, the the book in Vienna, the trees are still the trees still remain. Uh, that was a huge. I got a huge audience, um, and it was a kind of a breakthrough book for me, and it received several prizes. And uh, no, it was it was received as in something important about telling a story about what Sweden used to be, uh, because Sweden has had a strange relationship to the World War, the years of the World War II, the Second World War, uh, having an idea of it being a neutral country, but actually not being neutral, uh, having business connections with Nazi Germany throughout the war, but also having political connections with the allies, and at first being very restricted towards Jewish refugees, hardly allowing anyone in, to in the end of the war actually receiving almost 8,000 Jews from Denmark and thereby saving them, saving them for real from deportation. When the Norwegian Jews were deported, arrested and deported, Sweden wanted, they pleaded to the Nazis to not take any more Nor Norwegian Jews, but let them come to Sweden. But Nazi Germany said no. So a year later, when the turn had come to the Danish Jews, the, Jew, the Danish resistance were, became in touch with the Swedish government and said, now this is going to happen within a couple of days. The Danish Jews are going to be transported to Poland. So the Swedish government said, come. 
And this is one of the most miraculous events throughout Holocaust history. So Sweden actually moves from one part of the scale to the other. And this goes also ideologically. So after the war, when Sweden wants to remember itself, it tends to remember the good things and not the bad things. So when I wrote this book about Otto Ullmann and, and Ingvar Kamprad and talked about Sweden before it became a good country, uh, a lot of Swedes said, I don't recognize this. Is this my country you're talking about? So I think I, uh, trig I triggered a, a good conversation about what is memory and what is self-image and what was Sweden. So I think it was a fantastic response to that book. Uh, the book 1947, um, this one, it's, it had, um, it's had a, a good reception in Sweden, but even more in Europe. I think uh, in a lot of uh, other countries, this feels more acute, more, um, it feels like a more um, present book than in Sweden. Sweden, in Sweden, the relationship to history is quite thin, and um, but a lot of people have has loved this book. So I, I'm not complaining, but I do feel that in Poland or in Italy uh, and in some other countries, I've had a massive response on this book, 1947 which has been fantastic. It's, it's interesting. I, I guess when I think about America and I think about Europe, I do think um, that they feel very, con they feel that connection to history very strongly. Hmm. So, you know, it's interesting that in Sweden, that's not the case. I didn't realize that. Well, it's a different kind of, of history. I think it goes a bit for the, all the Scandinavian countries that the welfare state when that was created, it, it sort of uh, started a new phase of history telling. And especially in Sweden, one doesn't like to remember the bad things. I think I'm married to a Danish man, so I, I spend a lot of time in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And there they, they tend to, they have more days of remembrance there, but they also had uh, for instance, World War II right on their streets. There were German soldiers there. Danes were killed in the center of Copenhagen. They have graves. There, there was a resistance movement. All, nothing of this happened in Sweden. So Sweden could tuck, could tuck the memory away in another way. The same goes for Finland. Finland had the war within the family. Uh, they have graves. Each and every family in Finland has a grave connected to Second World War, I would say. So the memory there is very much alive. But Sweden, they could, they could cut it off because they were, well, they were sort of standing on the side, being involved, but not directly. But through this, I mean, they, they did, there are questions about if the Swedish export of uh, some vital stuff like I know I'm not sure what the names are in English uh, but iron the what you get from for instance Sweden has very good quality of this metal and uh, the Germans wanted it for uh, for making uh, weapons uh, for instance and other things connected to it so there is there are historians asking the question that if Swedish export actually prolonged the war. And of course, Churchill and the Allies, they were furious that Sweden continued to export these things to Nazi Germany. And it also had the consequence that after the war, when Europe was in ruins, Sweden was in a quite good place. Yeah. And I think Sweden also had some kind of guilty conscience for this because they, the country did great rescue missions after the war uh, and was a home for a lot of refugees. A lot of people from directly from the camps came to Sweden and uh, they got medical 
help and they could eat themselves into normal weight and then move on. So after, war, after the war, Sweden tried to make up for, for what it's lost in its moral sense, it tried to make up in a humanitarian sense. I hope my English is good enough. I yeah, feel like it's yeah. perfect. Okay. It is perfect. Good, good. Well, I'm not perfect. Um, we do have a question. Mm -hmm. What is the current state of anti-Semitism in your country? And do your books have any wake-up messages for modern day Jewry? Well, I try to avoid messages in my books uh, because if I wanted to have message, a message, I would become maybe something else than a writer. But uh, so the answer for the, on that question is no. But the, the state of anti-Semitism in Sweden is an interesting question. There are sort of three lines of anti-Semitism in Sweden. We have now, unfortunately, hardcore Nazis uh, alive and kicking in the country. They are an anti-Semitism in the old school way, if you excuse my expression. Uh, we all know this. This is traditional uh, hatred like in Nazi Germany. And they are quite uh, violent and they do their best to spread fear. So they are actually a kind of, they are a threat to democracy. And in some sense, they have been threats to individual Jews, people who are visible in the in society, people who have a, a famous faces or famous names. So that is one group that is active in Sweden. And then there is another group that has open, shown open anti-Semitism. And this is uh, directly from the Palestine, Israel-Palestine conflict uh, or occupation, where people with uh, identities from the Middle East have, um, well, they are, they are anti-Semites uh, in that sense, hating Israel, hating Zionism, and hating everyone they think are representative representatives of these things. That means that, uh, for instance, for almost one and a half year ago, a synagogue in Sweden's second biggest city, Gothenburg, was actually torched. Well, they tried to torch it. Uh, they, they only started a fire in a connecting building. But these were three guys, one from Palestine and two from Syria. Uh, so suddenly uh, a Swedish Jewish congregation is physically attacked from people who had come from to Sweden as refugees. Uh, so that's, and that is a growing problem. Uh, I would say both of these things are growing problems. Uh, and then there is a kind of a third, more mainstream floating around. It's not as aggressive, but it's still there. Um, and, and that's, I think a lot of people think they're critical of Israel from a kind of leftist point of view, but they are actually um, carrying on an anti-Semitic tradition. So, I think the best example of that is, for instance, when this synagogue torching, they, they threw a Molotov cocktail towards this synagogue uh, and they were arrested and they were brought to court and they were convicted to jail. And the Palestinian guy, he didn't have a Swedish connection that was strong enough. So he was also, in his conviction, he was supposed to be returning to Palestine. He wasn't allowed to stay in Sweden in the first conviction. But then it was a, there was an appeal and the second judge said that because he had torched a Swedish synagogue, Israel might get to him if he went back to Palestine, so it was safer for him to stay in Sweden. 
So this was a Swedish uh, legal, you know, in, the, in quite a high, high position. So I and someone else actually wrote something about this in the paper because this is, this is a very typical anti-Semitic trope that the Jews in Gothenburg, they are Swedish Jews. Israel won't attack anyone who has attacked them. The Jews in Sweden are not connected to Israel in that sense. It's a kind of anti-Semitic idea that all Jews are connected and if you attack one, Israel will attack you. This was completely, uh, this was completely anti-Semitic to just make this long story short. So actually our text and some people reacted, some more people reacted and, and he changed this chain, he changed the verdict or the verdict was changed in another legal level. Uh, but so we have these thoughts within society. It's, it's um, an idea of Israel uh, that turns easily, very easily turns into uh, anti-Semitic thoughts. Now I've talked a real long time. I'm sorry about that. No, I, 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 sadly, I think, you know, we're experiencing the same thing here in America. And I, and I think in Europe as well. Um, yes, I think so too. So we have to be very vigilant, all of us. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. One more question, one last question. Um, Malma seems to be the heart of Muslim anti-Semitism now, and was the heart of the, and was the heart of the Nazi movement during and after the war. Are there any connections? I think I'm sorry. Still... What was the term? The first term. So, um, Ellen and Ellen can unmute herself if she wants to and and clarify. Malma? Oh, Malma. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry Malma, maybe. Yes, this is the third biggest city in Sweden, and it's in the south of Sweden. Um, and it was the center. Yes, well, uh, is there a connection? I'm not sure there is. In one sense, there is. Uh, there is an historian, in a Swedish historian. She has shown that... Uh, where there in the 30s used to live uh, Swedes in the south of Sweden who were um, supporting the Nazi movement they are now their their grandchildren are still supporting uh, racist movements so in a way just like democratic values are inherited within a family also anti-democratic values are inherited. So there's a definite connection she has shown between the south of Sweden and these some of these ideas. Uh, and then we have Malmö as a place who where a lot of immigrants have, um, it's become the home of a lot of immigrants. And that doesn't necessarily mean anti-Semitism, but there we come to the Swedish um, I would say failure of assimilation. Sweden has in several cities, but Malmö in particular, segregated the uh, immigrants from the non-immigrants, which means there are isolated islands where the Swedish society does not reach their citizens. They don't learn Swedish, uh, not good enough or not at all and they have values or they build up values that are not compatible with the Swedish society. So in Denmark they call them ghettos. I, in Sweden we don't use that word but that's the idea. So in Malmö this has been quite long gone and there's a lot of uh, people there from the Middle East that or with their children or grandchildren are people from the Middle East, but the ideas are still there uh, of uh, Jews or Israel as something very, very uh, bad. So just the other day, there was this completely um, ironic situation. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to take it lightly, but I can't, it is ironic. There is a Danish, 
right-wing guy and he's connected to Swedish Nazis and he's been burning the Koran in Denmark, which he was sentenced for because that was not acceptable. He came to Malmö and wanted to burn the Koran there as well. So he went to the area where there were most Muslims and they tried to burn the Koran and they also, these Nazis kicked the Koran around like it was a football. So of course people were extremely upset and there it became riots, uh, which I don't think is acceptable, but this is what happened. And during these riots, the people were shouting anti-Semitic slogans. So here we have Nazis coming to Malmö and the reactions are anti-Semitic slogans. So that for me is a picture of how anti-Semitism is sort of all over the place and it pops up in, in this most ironic way. Uh, I mean, the, there wasn't a Jew close to this. Uh, and even if there was, you shouldn't have anti-Semitic slogans. But so I would say that anti-Semitism is, is more present in the society than we'd like it to be. And I think that goes for a lot of places in Europe. I mean, Great Britain has these huge problems with the Labour Party. In France, there are huge problems all through society with anti-Semitism. So it's not particular Sweden, but I think Sweden is not, I'm not proud of, of the way it has developed here. Thank you very much. This has been just, uh, you know, it's like the, the, for me, meeting a celebrity. So oh. um, I, again, you know, if you, if you haven't read the books, both of them are wonderful. 1947, Where Now Begins. You have that book in, and, um, uh -huh. and, and In the Woods, in the Vienna, I don't know why I was, The Trees Remain. You will not be sorry. It's a wonderful, wonderful book, both of them. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Thank been you for fun. having me. Thank you everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.